Low, uh, low, uh, low. Here we are, we're going to finish up uh, uh, today, uh, almost nearly there. Then we go, we, I'll tell you what we do afterwards, we're human. We go and have a coffee and a cake. That's what we do afterwards, every Friday. <laughs> so, it's working there, Brian, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, just remind you, we're just working questions from different churches, all sorts of churches. We've had people today new in the university that want to find a church, so we pointed them in different directions. Uh, we're just sharing some things, and right now, for the last few minutes, I just want to cover. Um, I put on the board there, I always do graphics. You can probably see man plus woman plus what Christ did, the creator of the cross, is love, and it's the best love we're ever going to experience. Sometimes men and women have great love in a marriage, but it can be nothing like this. Because while we were still, and I include myself, while we were still warring against God, He came and gave His life and that gift on the cross so that we could have eternal life. And you won't get eternal life on Facebook or Twitter or any other social social site. Uh, you can only find it on the cross. He's the only one that's ever done it. No one else has done it. You know, sometimes they call him a prophet, but of course he's much more than a prophet. He healed the sick. He rose from the dead. Um, he forgave the world of sin. And he gave that gift on the cross. It's a gift through love for his creation. And it's up to you. Here's how much he loves you. He gives you the freedom of choice. Just like our kids. I've got kids and grandkids. And you know, can you force your love on them? No, you can't. Can you force certain things? No, you can't. True love gives you freedom of choice to work things out for yourself and come to a conclusion. And that's what Christ did on the cross. That's true love. And put your hands up, girls. I'll mention the girls. Are there any girls that have got a guy chasing them for a date? Can he force you to have a date with you? Of course he can't. Of course he cannot. Can he force you to love him? No, not a chance. So love is always freely given. And that's why God gives us the choice. And uh, we prevent ourselves from having eternal life. God forces no one into heaven. I just want to cover some things here about faith. We hear about faith all the time. But I'm just going to cover quickly now um, five areas of faith. And... I'm going to put them up on the board to think about. I'm going to put up my faith. You've heard that statement before. Yes. Blind faith. We don't want blind faith, do we? Because we don't know where we're coming from. We don't know where we're going. And you, you've heard, have you heard that statement? Let me ask you. The blind leading the blind. Where are you going to end up when the blind is leading the blind? It's very difficult, isn't it? So, blind faith is faith with no evidence in what you believe, no assurance of the outcome of your faith. So if you have no assurance, no assurance of your faith, there's a kind of blind faith. My own faith and trust is based on historical evidence. My faith is based on what Christ did, historical evidence. My faith is not just to guess it and I hope it works out by the end of the time I, I die. My faith is based on historical evidence. The empty tomb, those who were with him, ate with him, touched him, witnessed miracles documented evidence and also non-Christian documented evidence of Roman historians and politicians at that time who wrote about Jesus didn't necessarily believe in what he said but they wrote about him politicians, Romans and 
to historians. You look at the date on your watch, that date on your watch starts from his birth. Now at the time of Jesus, Tiberius Caesar was the most powerful man in the world of his day. Jesus was one of the poorest belonging to the peasant class as a Jewish carpenter. He even died the most shameful death, a slave's death on a cross during Tiberius's reign. Yet we have more reliable written sources and closer to the time of Jesus' actual life and death than this Caesar of Rome. There is more reliable, documented, historical resources about Jesus than there is the emperor of that time. You go do your research. <coughs> Next one I want to put up on there is dead fire. Uh, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? You know, someone may say, well, I believe there is a God, but, you know, I'll live my own life. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Ask yourself these questions. Ask yourself these questions. I don't want to be dead while this van comes along. <laughs> so I get that point. So James was saying there, now, he's not saying that by your works and good works you are saved for eternity. He's not saying that. Oh no. He's not saying that. But what he's saying is, out of your real faith, the Spirit of God should produce works. In fact, they were set up for you before time. The next one is demonic faith. Demonic faith, you say? I've never heard that before. James also teaches that even demons believe and shudder at the name of Jesus Christ. Their faith is intellectual. It's in the mind. That is, the demons have no doubt that Jesus is the Son of the living God, but they rebelliously choose to serve a different master, the devil. You can't serve, you may have heard this, but you and I can't serve two masters at the same time. We have to choose. And Christ gives you that choice. Next faith is vain faith. Not everyone who says that Jesus is Lord of their lives will enter the kingdom of heaven on the day of his return. Only those who actually do the will of God will be permitted entry into eternal life. Responding to an altar call, saying the sinner's prayer, or religiously and generously tithing, these alone will not save you. So that is vain faith. If we think we're going to stand before God Almighty, the most powerful, loving Creator, and if we think we're going to stand before Him and say, hey, look, God, this is what I did to earn my eternal life, it's not going to work, folks. Let me just tell you. Let me love you and just give you some truth. Now, the last one is called saving faith. <coughs> So we have blind faith, we have dead faith, we have demonic faith, we have vain faith, and now we have saving faith. This is the faith that Christ talked about. The message of John 3.16 is so clear, God loves every one of us. You may walk past here and shut that door on God, God still loves you. He gave you the choice. That's what love is. When your kids do wrong, do you stop loving them? What do you do? Do you, When your kids do wrong, do you say, right, you're off to the orphanage? <laughs> you
you did wrong. <laughs> no! We love them even more and teach them even more that they will understand. That's what love is. <laughs> I can tell you with my grandkids, I have to keep loving them. Two boys, oh, they fight like anything. You are not saved because of any good works. Let me just go back here. Uh, God loves every one of us. He sent His only begotten Son to live among us. And whoever believes on Jesus will have eternal life. That's, that's it. We've been given the grace. It's up to us to receive it. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says it very well. It provides us with some additional details. You are saved by grace through faith. Salvation is a gift. That's what I'm talking about on the cross. That gift. It was a gift. A gift is most often times a gift that we don't deserve. You are not saved because of any good works you ever did, but you were made to do good works and point people in the direction of God and Christ. God prepared many good things for you to do. As you live by saving faith, you will supernaturally produce good fruit good fruit. An apple tree does not produce grapes. As you live by saving faith, we supernaturally produce good fruits. Works and evidence that you are no longer a slave to sin. I was a slave to sin. Oh dear, oh dear. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. Here's your evidence that you will experience. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. You can read this in the book of John. These things I have written to you believe the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Here, how about that? You may know that you have eternal life. This is not guesswork. This is not us here waiting to the last second of our lives and then hoping everything works out okay. No, 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 no. We know we have eternal life. Yes. 12 minutes. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So I leave that with you. Those five areas of faith, blind faith, dead faith, demonic faith, vain faith, and saving faith. So when you hear people talk about faith in the world, remember... Not all faith is the same. There's a wonderful word in the Bible, and I just want to share this with you. It says, whosoever, and it goes like this, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. It doesn't matter what color skin you are. It doesn't matter what country you were born in. It doesn't matter what you were taught in your family. It doesn't even matter what family you were raised in. Because if King Charles III, like his mother, would bow that knee to the true King of Kings, he would be saved. So whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's my prayer for you, Norman. To you, my name is I love you, so I'll tell you the truth. Thank you for listening.